introduction of the live stream is still in there. Oh, no, I know that part of it, yes. What's well, not my first rodeo? Okay, so do you have more to say? Is it short? Yes, ma'am. Very, very quickly, I want to remind everyone we are streaming this live on uh, vicenza.afneurope.net or on the Garrison website. Uh, you can address questions if you're streaming on the Garrison Facebook page. Go to VMC Italy. And for those of us here in the arena, please remember that we do not address matters of a legal or medical <laughs> issue, uh, issues that can be addressed through the chain of command or issues submitted using inflammatory or derogatory language. And when using questions, please use the microphones located on both sides of the room. Thank you. Thanks, I appreciate that. First, I'd like to introduce um, my, uh, the team that travels with me. Uh, Sergeant Major Mike Schultz is the senior enlisted, and so he and I will kind of do a, um, a Huntley Brinkley. That means, for those of you that remember Huntley Brinkley, um, for those of you that don't, it means that we both will answer questions and talk. Um, Mr. Dave Sheridan, a retired colonel, is a special assistant. Colonel Odie Sheffield is the senior military assistant. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Julie Bolton is a military assistant. Um, we all work in personnel and readiness. And for those of you that don't exactly know what personnel and readiness does, in a snapshot, we handle everything military personnel and civilian personnel. That's the personnel side of it. Um, almost cradle to grave. So we do everything with the session policy through transition. We do everything with DOD schools, with commissaries, everything with health care, um, whether it's TRICARE or the MTFs. It all falls under um, personnel and readiness. So that's a snapshot of the personnel side. There's a whole lot more, voting assistance, suicide, um, uh, SAPRO, sexual assault, uh, trafficking in persons. Um, it, it all falls under personnel. The second thing is the readiness piece. We, our shop is responsible for the overall readiness of the Department of Defense. That's not to take anything away from the service secretaries or the service chiefs. They do yeoman's work and they feed the information up to us and we do it as a team. Um, our shop does not do anything at all without coordinating with the services. When we create policy, whether it's civilian policy or military policy, or health affairs policy, we work with the services to get their concurrence to implement and to make that policy. And then if there's an issue with that policy, then we take it back and we revise it. And that's what I come here for. I come here to talk to you to see if there are issues, I'll even say complaints, if there's goodness, if there's things that we've done right, um, but things that we may have put out in a policy that the second and third order of effect of that policy may be a little bit more thorny than the issue that we put out. And, and so if I can change that in any way, um, I need to look at doing that. And I, can't, I don't know that information from the office in the Pentagon. And so that's why I try to come out to organizations and I'm very grateful um, to General Williams and his staff that he has allowed me to spend a few uh, two days here. I just got back from Launstool. I spent a day there, and, and uh, before that, we were at the Invictus Games in um, London. If you don't know what they are, they are London's uh, Wounded Warrior Games. And the United States had 100 um, team members that walked onto the field or, or wheeled onto the field, either or, and I'm telling you, it just gave you shivers to see those amazing heroes um, and that they're going to participate in uh, things like rowing and swimming and wheelchair rugby. And um, they are an inspiration for all of us. So with that, I'll turn it over to the Sergeant Major. Um, he, does, he's not a, he doesn't have a mic, but he has a command voice. So, so Sergeant Major, if he, and you'll have to excuse me, I do have a, a small cough. So <coughs> Sergeant Major, if you will. OK, thank you, ma'am. Sir, Sergeant Major, uh, to the spouses and military members here, it's uh, it's an honor to be here. I've been through Vincenza a couple times before, previously never stationed here, but I've been through here. So we do understand some of the challenges that uh, you guys have being separated from CONUS. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that my boss didn't say is, as far as her, uh, you know, her background was, is that you know she was enlisted in the Army as well, aviator, and then has went through the ranks all the way as a retired two-star. 
funeral also. So I guess the, the thing that I'll solicit from you guys is, is with your questions and when you're talking to her, she obviously gets the service being in her position, but she actually lived and walked in our booth for those serving in uniform right now, so she gets it. And uh, is very <laughs> passionate about that. And one of the things, again, she said about the Invictus Games and our Wounded Warriors, but obviously very passionate about our service members, but our Wounded Warriors, especially our Gold Star family members, and then also, too, as well, is, you know, the families and our civilians out there. So, again, this is a great opportunity for you to uh, ask those questions, be very candid with her. And, uh, again, it's a pleasure to be here, ma'am. Thanks for that. Thanks. I will tell you, um, and Sergeant Major talked a little bit about my career. My most important job that I have is being a mom. And uh, I, I am a mom of a, a young 25-year-old lieutenant who is an infantry officer, and my husband was a soldier. So I kind of have that Army background um, within me. Uh, so I, I, I kind of understand it from both sides, but I don't understand it from your side. And, and that's what I'm here to listen to. So I open it up to any questions um, that you have or a statement, um, so please feel free. And I have lots of note takers over here, so if you don't see me writing it down, please don't think I'm not paying attention to We have three people over here writing it down. And we have a couple people on BlackBerry sending the question back, if you have it, to try to get an answer before we leave, okay? And the first question's always the hardest. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. jumping in. Hi, I'm jumping in as an excited volunteer. We have three uh, school-aged children, so we're looking at being involved at the school, with mm -hmm. sports, at the church, and where else we can. One of the challenges we have is filling out all of the paperwork to be a volunteer at each place. We understand the intent of the necessary background checks. However, we have found as active volunteers, it's prohibited a lot of people to participate as volunteers but also it's so time intensive that it slows us down. And we've wondered from a cost standpoint and a time standpoint if there's a way to streamline background checks. So for instance, once you've been approved from CYS that you're good to go, could you have a green card to take to the school and to take to the church and other organizations so that everybody's on the same page with the background checks? So perhaps at East Duty Station. Not if you have it at the beginning of your career and you're going to carry this through sure, your career. Sure, sure, because things change, of course. So I don't know, where's the garrison commander? I don't know if that's a, is that a garrison policy or my policy? For the, the records checks? For the multiple records checks for every organization. Let me take a look at it. Okay. <clears throat> so let me, let's find out one, if it's a garrison policy or mine. One, I do know the policy of having a background check is an OSD policy. But whether you have to have six because you're volunteering at six organizations or one because you're volunteering on the installation, I don't know. But we will get you that answer and, and, and work at it. One thing I don't do is I don't jump into the garrison's knickers. I, we may point out an issue and they may, they may take a look at it, but I don't, um, I don't tell the garrison that's not my responsibility to tell either General Williams or anybody you have to change this because there might be a overarching issue that I don't understand that um, that we need to do this. So, but we have the issue, and between the two of us, we will get an answer. Okay. But did you get her name, sir? Okay. Okay. Oh, oh. So you know. Hi, Jenna. <coughs> Uh, my name is Ann Fugate. I'm uh -huh. the Act and Volunteer Coordinator for right now. Okay. Sounds like I need to get some information out. Uh, when we, so for among the organizations who require background checks, mm -hmm. as long as one background check is done with an organization in the community, a copy of that can be shared among other organizations. So for instance, if you first in process as a volunteer with a school, you can just request that copy be transferred, say, to CYSS at that point. So you don't need to redo the same thing at every organization. In fact, please don't. <laughs> so. Well, great. Yeah. And actually, I've got an, a, an OPOC advisory council meeting coming up on September 30th. So I have just added that to the agenda right there. So thank you. Well, thank you. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you for the question and thank you for the answer. All righty. Yes, ma'am. There's one back here. Hi, my name is Leanne Ferris. Um, 
a few of us ladies are starting a new private organization to um, answer a problem that we see in our community, which I think is a problem all over um, duty stations outside of the U.S. And it, the problem is getting our pets to and from the U.S. and information um, being available on how to do that. If you ever go to Military One Source, they will tell you. Uh, we we have checked most of the sites. Military but One there's Source not detailed information about how to do that. Okay, if you call to uh, seriously, mm -hmm. if you call Military One Source, and you tell them because they have tried, they have gotten a horse to Hawaii. Um, if you tell them, I mean, they will find you a dry cleaner in the place that you're going. If you call and you ask them the specific question, I have a border collie and I need to get it to Italy, can you tell me the specific issues that I need to deal with? Do I have to crate it? Do I have to quarantine it? What kind of shots do they have to have? They may not be able to tell you right that second, but they will get back to you. Um, so you can form your group, but before you do, I would, I would um, offer you that resource because I just went to Military One Source and got a tour of the whole place. I was surprised at what they do. They provide, and this might come in handy for people overseas, free of charge translation services. They provide tax information and will help you do your taxes. So they, um, they have a, a, a robust um, service and oftentimes we think that they're for somebody that's on the cusp of maybe um, doing something harmful to themselves uh, on the mental health field. But Military One Source has a variety of services. So um, have you used them, ma'am? Um, for other things, but not specifically for that. And our, our group is specifically uh, to help people get transportation <coughs> because what we're finding is people are coming into airports and their animals are not allowed on the shuttle bus or there is no shuttle bus to the airports that they're coming into. So they come into Aviano, they come into Milan, they come into Rome with their pets, and okay. they have no way to get here. And they don't realize that before they get here. I understand. So we're forming the organization to try and help people get that transportation. Okay. Um, and from what I've seen online, it sounds like it's a problem in all of the overseas locations that we get our pets here and then we don't realize um, it's going to be a little bit more difficult than just getting them here. Okay. So if I can do a couple rack. of things. One, I will talk to Military One Source okay. and see if they can um, do a, you know, do a data call that finds out if you're, you know, if you're going to Schweinfurt and you need to bring your pet, what, what resources are there um, or anywhere else, you know, what resources are there. Um, we'll, we'll have them start to work on that because that would be another resource. And two, um, you know, I can talk to the garrison commander because maybe it's something that it can be put into the sponsorship packet or something like that. But if you have any ideas, um, I, I will tell you I'm a firm believer that uh, great ideas bubble up from, you know, the people that have to do the heavy lifting. So if you have any great ideas, we'll be willing to listen to them and see if we can, you know, implement them. But, but Clearly, when they told me, and they also got a plane somewhere. I want to fly, I have a plane, I need it broken down and sent somewhere. And they were able to tell this person, they don't pay for it, but they were able to tell this person how to get that done, very specifically. Um, so it, it really is a very good resource. But it's, I will add um, that to the list of maybe things they can help us out with. Great, thank, thank you, you very for much. That. I, yes, sir. Probably be heard without the microphone. <laughs> with, with the streaming light. Just the audience. Uh, yes, ma'am. Just to, to, my name is Paul Matika. The pet thing really resonates, and I think that the information needs to be at the transportation offices, in the personnel offices, not just here, but it needs to be in place. Of, I came here with my wife from Fort Carson, mm -hmm. and after 22 and a half years in the Army, that wasn't my first move. It was the most difficult move I've ever made with a pet. Okay. Even going to Japan was easier than <coughs> getting a pet moved nowadays. The transportation people didn't know what to do. Okay. You know, they had answers, but the answers were useless. That's where the information needs to be, or else they need to be able to tell people, go to Military One Source. But it's not an easy task, no matter what. Well, great information, and I appreciate that. Because um, So uh, 
David is writing it down, we can get it to the vices. They can get it to where they need to get it in, in the transportation network. Um, and, and we can start figuring this out. Or at least have it on the checklist of things that you need to know. I, I will tell you, I also understand from the standpoint of evacuating people when there is an emergency. When we had to evacuate people from Japan in the beginning, um, when they had the, the tsunami, we didn't have a really robust, um, or um, uh, what I'm trying to, DOTI, uh, Department of Defense Instruction, that explained that you can leave with your pets. I'm an owner of two Border Collies, and I will not leave them because they're part of my family. Some people don't like pets as much as I do, but I understand. So we, we got together with all of the COCOMs, and we wrote the DOTI to include these kinds of things because we know they're members of families. And so we, we will pay attention to that. I really appreciate it. Thank you both. Anybody else? How's the hospital care downtown? Mm -hmm. um, okay. um, I was just there yesterday for an outpatient procedure. Um, the, there's a disconnect between getting someone who speaks English mm -hmm. there. The staff um, <coughs> were great, but there's a, there's a limit to what they can do when they don't speak English and I don't speak Italian. Um, it was an emotion, it was a very traumatic emotional experience for me mm -hmm. because um, it was kind of an emergency mm -hmm. and unplanned. Mm -hmm. The liaison was apparently not made aware, so we never saw the patient liaison. Does the patient liaison speak Italian? Yes. Okay. Yes, they're bilingual. Okay, um, so it, and so I assume the patient liaison can't be there 24 hours a day. I, they, they are. They are okay, there. they are. He was in labor and delivery with someone because, and, and he, I did speak to him on the phone at one point mm -hmm. because they couldn't figure out how to tell me to do something that okay. they needed me to do. Um, and he was in labor and delivery, delivery. The problem was somebody didn't put in the paperwork to have another patient liaison there. So we went through the day making do with mm -hmm. um, not much English and Italian. Well, first, I apologize for that, and I'm sure everybody else would, because the fact of the matter is um, we're all human, and sometimes you know, the, somebody didn't put the paperwork in is a human issue, and sometimes we make mistakes. I make them plenty every day. Um, but you, we do have a patient liaison. I heard you say they're, they're understaffed. I don't, know what the, I don't know what the staff number is for that, whether it's 10 or whether it's 3. But you know, we'll... we'll We'll talk to the garrison commander, and, and I'm going to talk to Dr. Barr, and there he is. Uh, but I, uh, that's one of the reasons that I came here, um, was clearly to go and talk to Dr. Barr, talk about the medical care, particularly because I know that we're, we're going to an Italian hospital and that the language is a barrier. They may be prescribed different medicines. There could be other different issues. They could work fine the majority of the time, and then sometime maybe they don't. Um, but that's, I mean, I have a whole half a day with him tomorrow to kind of get through those eaches. But I appreciate you sharing your experience with us. I've been to the OBGY clinic there, and they're extremely nice. They're wonderful. Um, and all the staff at the hospital really are very sweet. And Good. It's just, it's, it's a language issue. Right. When things don't get done the way they should get done. Okay. So. And that's something that's very important. So thank you. Wait, sir, there was a question in the front. We're streaming live, so you have to talk either loud or use okay. a mic. <laughs> the, uh, the uh, hospitals in Italy probably relate to about <coughs> what they were in, in the 1950s in the United States, having been exposed to some of the outlying areas and some of those places. They don't have the same attitude about pain suppression and these things that we have in the United States, and it can be an issue. Okay, and I appreciate that too. I think that it's important if that's the case that you talk to the patient liaison. You have Dr. Barr here who, who will listen, but, but we, need to, we need to work individually sometimes. And so, and I'm sure Dr. Barr has taken notes. There was a question in the, right. Go ahead, ma'am. Um, I was just gonna say, just to, to add a little tidbit to the uh, situation at the hospital. Um, how do 
I say this nicely? No offense to the Italians, but it's kind of filthy there. Um, bugs in, tons of bugs and broken lights and water leaking in the waiting area, in the, in the ER waiting area. Um, I don't mean to sound snobby, but there is a hygiene issue with the, the, I've watched people use the same gloves on multiple patients and even take the gloves off, put them in their pocket. Sheets being just turned inside out for the next patient, things like that. And I don't know what the standard is for us to utilize, okay. if that's okay. Well, I appreciate your candor. Yeah. Um, Dr. Barr is taking notes, and I think it's important for him to hear this too um, as a forum. So thank you very much for your candor. I have to go to that now. Okay. I left the ER. You left the, okay. I left Okay. Absolutely. Ma'am, I'd like to uh, I'm sorry. just toss in my two cents. Having been here more than a year, and I don't want you to think we have a bad hospital downtown. Mm -hmm. It's been a hospital for 900 years. I'm sure there are issues here and there, but I've had great success with my family to include some very serious emergencies over time. Okay. And they were served very well. Uh, the patient lays on people down there, pedal very hard okay. to uh, get it done. And, and I'm not going to say there are no issues, but I don't want you to go away with right. four people having given you their problem, not know that there are some good sides to it as well. Okay, and, and, and that's really good information. I will tell you in most hospitals we have pockets of excellence, and then we normally have uh, what I call, you know, just satisfactory care, which we have in Hershey Medical Center, um, uh, which is a huge medical center in, in uh, Pennsylvania. And then we have those areas that we need to improve. So I am sure... Uh, is it San Bartolo Hospital? I am sure San Bartolo Hospital has pockets of excellence, and I'm sure that it has satisfactory care, and then I'm sure that it has those areas that they've been identified that we need to improve. So I think that's really good information that uh, Dr. Barr can take away and, and certainly take a look at, um, because we, we want to provide good medical care, great medical care, not only for our service members, but we have 9.6 million beneficiaries in our TRICARE network, and some of them are here. So we want to make sure that we take care of them. Okay? Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, ma'am, but while we're on the topic of hospitals, um, if there's a way that we can find out, there's some services that our hospital can't provide and San Bordolo cannot, and that's fine because every experience that I've had with San Bordolo <coughs> also was great. But there are some services that if you need certain procedures or if your children have certain issues, they, re they require you to go to launch stool. But if you, talk, uh, or if you talk to another agency in the area, they can also provide the same service, but it's not able to get TRICARE. They're not able to accept that. So if there's a way that we could also find agencies that can assist in certain situations instead of going all the way to launch stool, and I know there's a shuttle bus and we're grateful for that, but if there's other means, if we can find it here. I mean, a, I mean another hospital that will accept TRICARE. Yes, ma'am. Well, not, they will not accept the TRICARE, or they may, I don't know, but we're not eligible to go to them because they're not on the preferred list. So I'm not sure if it's they can accept it or not. I'm not sure about okay, all I'm going to let the doc answer that per particular question. If In the local network, we have all services available for anything that you might need, local versus launch tool. A lot of it gets down to a preference on where the patient would like to go, and if the patient would like to go to launch tool to receive those services, again, we've got medical TDY, or you can get on the shuttle bus and go do that. If you'd prefer to have your surgery done locally, uh, we may not have it at San Bordolo, but we have two university hospitals in the network, both in Padua and Verona. So a lot of the time, it really just depends on you getting together with the referring provider, letting them know where you want to go, and then going down to our referral management center, and then they'll take care of you. So that, that's how we've got it set up. Thank you very much. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Over here. Hi, I'm Leanne Patterson, and we're fairly new here, so we're just transitioning in. And I actually have compliments to the medical staff at the facility here. Um, we recently tried to refill prescriptions, and apparently the pharmacy system here is not linked to the pharmacy system stateside. So although I had renewed everything stateside mm -hmm. and they were all in the system, only the primary care clinic and the pediatric clinic were able to see the refills 
and uh, I had to go over there. They handled they handled this at lightning speed. They usually mm -hmm. have three days to call you back. I had everything in my hands in under an hour. Great. And went over to the pharmacy, and of course their line is, I think it's seven days to fill things, mm -hmm. and they, ha they called me the very next day. They had transferred everything over. What I was wondering, though, is if we could have the uh, system be able to see each other, <coughs> the system see each other the way that the primary care and the pediatric clinic can. I'm smiling because I so. want that too. <laughs> um, so we are in the process, um, and it's not going to come anytime soon. Um, when I say soon, I'm talking 17, and I think that's fairly quick. To, but we're in the process of getting a new electronic health record in DOD. Presently, we use a health record called Ulta, which is very old and um, needs Band-Aids and glue to keep it together. I know I'm streaming live, um, but, it, but I'm being honest. It's, it's, just, it's something that we have identified that we need to bring up to the 21st century. So there is an individual by the name of uh, Chris Miller who works for Acquisition Technology and Logistics and he works for Secretary Kendall. He is in the process of, he's put out an RFP for um, companies to, to bid on this system that we want to create that's an electronic health record that is going to work throughout the DOD system. As it works throughout the DOD system, it will be interoperable with the VA system. So it won't be the same system but it will be able to talk to it. So when you transition from a service member to a veteran, they will have your medical record. So should you choose or need to file for a disability, they will have them all already. Now this is, this is right now what we envision happening, but we believe that we will have the systems um, around 2017. We then need to field them all over our healthcare system. We manage the largest healthcare system in the world. And so we're going to field this system. We are talking to the doctors now because we don't want to buy something that they can't use. We want to buy something that is medical professional friendly, that they can easily use, that doesn't take a lot of training, that they can understand, that they can have easy input to, and that will work. Um, so we're in the process of doing that, but again, that we've identified a need. Um, it takes, our system takes a while to get moving, and we're hoping to have these systems in place in 2017 with the understanding now we have to field them. And that's, you know, we have hospitals all over the world, and we needed a system that was deployable. So when a, somebody deploys, that they can use this system to input what happens either on the battlefield or whether they're deployed on a training exercise. So, so we're kind of working that, that big bucket of spaghetti to make it all straight. Um, so it, it's something that is very important to us. It is extremely important to Secretary Hagel. That was one of the first decisions that he made when he came on board. Uh, we were going down a path that he didn't think was a successful path. And he made decisions that, um, he is the CEO of this very large organization. He's the Secretary of Defense. And we need a system that the Secretary of Defense is very comfortable with that we can use to support the beneficiaries and the men and women that he commands. Okay? But excellent point. Thank you. Ma'am, the uh, next question comes from on one of our online uh, viewers. Okay. So I'm passing this on for them. Uh. And they say, recognizing the, the fiscal constraints we're under and funding is always an issue, is is there a way to have funds allocated for child care for family members uh, rather than the pay for child care? Um, honestly, I would, uh, uh, to whomever said, uh, sent in the question, I would tell you I have to think about it. Um, we, uh, we are in a very tough fiscal environment. That is the first thing I have to tell you. Um, we have probably not been in this fiscal environment ever. Uh, when you balance the missions that we are are responsible to do, the hot spots that are around the world, the things that we have been doing since 2001, and the sequestration that we have been given from Congress, we have not been in this environment ever. Um, in 13 and 14, fiscal year 13 and 14, 
He kind of had a hiatus or a sabbatical from sequestration, and it wasn't fantastic, but it was palatable. In 16, we will go through sequestration if Congress doesn't repeal it. If they don't repeal it, what the Secretary says is, and what he says now is, everything is on the table. We have to balance quality of life, which is all those social programs that we get, the commissary, health care, child care, tuition assistance, all of those things that we get with quality of service, training, rotations at the National Training Center, mission accomplishment, um, modernization of equipment, um, equipment for our service men and women to perform their mission, all of those things, and we have to have an equal balance. That takes, uh, it's, a, it's a math problem is what it is. It's a math problem with emotion attached to it because we want, if we would send your soldier out the door who was not equipped, you would be very emotional about that. If we say you're going to have a, a 30%, a 10% savings at the commissary instead of a 30% savings, you would be very emotional about that. So those are the two buckets that we work in and we try to balance that. So to get back to the child care question, um, I don't know, honestly, I will be brutally honest, I don't know if we could give you the money other, uh, other than pay. I don't know what, that, what benefit that would reap. Um, but I will tell you that it's something that we look at. We look at family support and we look at child care. So I can't commit to you that we will do that. Um, what I will commit to you is that we will look at it and find out why you would, we would have to give you the money other than pay for child care. I would assume that it would be okay as long as you have good quality child care for the children that we love the most. Okay? Anybody else? What time are we? We're, oh, you want to ask a question? Okay, it's so our major. <laughs> what? <laughs> we don't. <laughs> Ma'am, ma I've uh, spoken to younger soldiers and their spouses, uh -huh. uh, well, really to the soldiers about their spouse, and even happened to, in my family, but is our dental plan. And it's a great dental plan, and it's compared to Blue Cross, Blue mm -hmm. Shield, and it's great. What I would submit is the one difference is we move. Mm -hmm. And so some of the, the care that somebody pay, a young sergeant staff sergeant pay uh, cost share, 50% for a bridge, let's mm -hmm. say, uh, is okay. But that bridge for that tooth is supposed to last 10 years, or the crown. But then you move six months later, and you have a problem. And normally you would go back to that mm -hmm. dentist and get it. They'd fix it right mm -hmm. away. But because you moved, that new dentist wouldn't do that. Or if you move overseas into Italy and, and you struggle that. So I just wonder if there's one way or some way we can look at that or be able to recoup money that the soldier or the dental plan plays to mm -hmm. a dentist after you've moved. Let, me, just, let me talk to TRICARE because um, so we have contracts for all of these things. And so to negate the contract, you know, I have to kind of talk to TRICARE and see where we are on it. It's a point that maybe should be written into a contract that maybe we haven't thought about. So Dave has captured that, and if we, when we do that, we can, um, it, when we get a new contract, we can look at changing it. Or we can look at potentially recouping the money. I, I clearly see the issue because most civilians, you know, they live in one city, they get braces for their kids, and they go back to the same orthodontist for the three years that the braces are on. We don't do that. We, we could move three times in those three years and go to three different orthodontists and have to fight the payment. Um, so let me check into it and see. It's, a, um, it's an excellent point. And, and I will tell you that's why I come out here, because people make the TRICARE rules that are sitting in an office who think, I mean, who clearly are doing the best job they can with the information they have. And, and I, I really respect them and they're bright people. But they don't walk in your shoes. And so, and even though I've been a soldier for 35 years, I retired four years ago and in that four years things have changed. So I don't necessarily walk in your shoes. I walked in different shoes. So I, I am very grateful for those kinds of um, comments that come out that I can take back and when we're writing the new contracts, we can look at it and say, 
have we thought about this? And what can we do to mitigate it? And we may not be able to mitigate it 100%, but 85% is certainly better than nothing. So thank you. In the back, sir? Just to follow up on what the Sergeant Major was talking about, when I was a commander at a, a remote camp, we worked with the local dentist to get them to accept what the dental program at the time was de built the dental insurance. But the problem was is that network, that insurance company insures much more than the Department of Defense. So we got the local dentist to agree to support the soldiers. And then when they enrolled into that program, then they started getting beneficiaries from other organizations. So they automatically shut off and wouldn't yeah. support us. So that, that was one of the challenges we dealt as a remote organization having to work with that insurance program. Okay. What is our time hack on the clock? I, just, I have 20 more minutes? Oh, we have 20 more minutes. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Jennifer Rickard. I just recently arrived here um, three weeks ago, and my question is, uh, where is the suicide prevention and resiliency training on the level for the spouse? On the level for the spouse? The spouse. We track our, mm -hmm. our soldiers and our veterans, but there's no tracking system for the spouses? We don't have tracking system for the spouses. It's one of the, so I am, um, I just became the co-chair for the National Alliance for Suicide. Um, it's run by Health and Human Services Secretary. Uh, Secretary McHugh, who was the Secretary of the Army, was the previous. That's one of the things that they said. There's no um, tracking of suicide for the spouses. Jackie Garrick, who runs our defense uh, suicide office, is looking to put that in place. Um, the second and third order of effect of, that, effect of that is a little thorny because sometimes people don't want to come forward and say that their spouse committed suicide. So it's really only as good as the honesty of the individual who's reporting it or and or not reporting it. So, so that's the issue. So I might be able to track it for a year and say there were X number of spousal suicides, but I don't know that I can put fidelity or great belief in that number if an individual didn't want to, ad, um, to admit that that happened within their family. Suicide is, um, su suicide is a, a, an issue that affects us all in one way or another, and it is also a very private thing. And so oftentimes, whether it's a service member or a spouse or a family member or a friend, um, you don't want to admit that that person took their own life. And, and so that, that's my issue. I'm kind of wrestling with how I do that and then how I really believe the number. So, but it's a very valid point, um, and I'm, I'm really wrestling with, or we're wrestling with, the best way to do it. Um, so but it happens. It's a valid point. Um, if not, we're looking at resiliency um, classes for the spouses to be able to, to do that, because one bad thing happen, happens to good people. There was a book written by a Jewish rabbi um, I guess he wouldn't be a, a rabbi if he wasn't Jewish, right? <laughs> yeah, I'm Catholic, and I've, I don't have Catholic rabbis. Oh, sorry about that. I, <laughs> there was a, a book written by a rabbi, um, and it was Bad Things Happen to Good People. Um, and it, it was a very good book. And uh, I will tell you, the Israelis have a phenomenal resiliency program um, because of what they go through. Um, so we need, we need to do that not only for our service members, um, but we need to do that for our family members um, because it, it's, it's not the bad things that happen in deployment. There are horrific things that happen in, when you're deployed. But it could be just juggling a finance problem and a school problem and a faith problem and you know, and wanting to buy Christmas presents problem or Hanukkah presents problem, and all that together in one bucket that gets you to wit's end. So it's n it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it had to happen on deployment. It is regular, regular life that sometimes gets you just all kind of tied up in the knot and you do something very, very horrific. So I appreciate your question. I, I will tell you, I don't have an answer that will that is baked yet, if you will. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
Um, in regards to spouse stress, <coughs> Um, with moving and going to new countries and mm -hmm. the, all the factors of the unknown. Um, I don't think I'm the only one that thinks that the spouse or the soldier sponsorship is an epic failure. And um, does that fall under your... The sponsorship within, you mean to get... So you're coming over here in the sponsorship program that the command has for you to get here. Right. So the, the command assigns a soldier, an E5 to an E5... And, and and a lot of times, the connect who they choose. Right. So you're you're assigned to go to Fort Gordon, Georgia, and you get a sponsor. You're, right. The soldier will get a sponsor. Right. It's mm -hmm. supposed to get a sponsor. Right. Mm -hmm. And that sponsor is supposed to be along the same lines, maybe right. rank, family, mm -hmm. dogs, all the above. Mm -hmm. And those don't ever really get matched equally at the get go, mm -hmm. if they get a sponsor at all. And then that sponsor, the soldier, never really follows through in my experience. Um, so with that being said, the spouse is hugely left hanging. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if maybe on your level there can be a program. There are spouse sponsorship programs, but they're failing as well. And um, most of it's on a volunteer basis. Mm -hmm. and I don't know if there's something that could be like a hired position to really make that program strong because coming to other countries, it is – so difficult for the spouses, let alone just the soldier taking care of everything. So I w I'm wondering if there can be a stronger system for the spouse mm -hmm. to get information two, three months prior to coming. So a couple of things I will tell you. Um, I would like to tell you that I have direct control of that, but I don't. Um, what we do is we, we in OSD say there needs to be a sponsorship program. And every single command has a sponsorship program. But we are blessed in today's age with a thing called Google. And I'm not making light of this, but before I came here, I Googled. Um, and my guys give me a lot of stuff, but I thought, I don't have enough. I'm going to Google. So I Googled. There was a person that came on the YouTube video that told me eight places to go and five places not to go. There was a person that told me all about your concern. Um, so what I, what I urge you to do is, um, one, I think the sponsorship program should work. I think that's very important. And I also think that if you're a soldier or if you're a spouse of a soldier and you find out that it is not working, perhaps, wherever you go, whether it's here or whether you go, you know, to, to, to Fort Belvoir and it's not working, that it's a responsibility of that soldier to reach out to somebody else. They have a chain of command and they know that to say, look, you know, the, I'm not really not getting the stuff I need. Can you help me out here? I think that's important. You're right. If the, if the soldier doesn't know the spouse's stress is, is just absolutely high. Again, I can't stress military one source enough. They will do the work for you. It, it's amazing what they do. They will do the work for you if you reach out to them. But if you don't reach out to them, they're not going to give you the work. And if you're computer savvy, Use the Google, because you can find out more things from that um, that is very current information. I mean, I, I, I got a picture of, you know, I got a picture of where I was staying here. I'm a fanatic about a hair dryer in my room. Um, and it's just, it's just one of the things that I like, and I like to know that it's there. So I Google, and, and I urge everybody uh, to be a proponent for themselves whether you are coming to a new place or whether you're going downtown to the hospital. Because there are liaisons out there and there are people that are going to take care of you, but you have to take care of you. And you really need to be a proponent for you. And you need to be forthright in going out and grabbing that information. So I urge you to do that. And the Google, or may, I, I probably should say Yahoo too, or Bing or any of those other things because I'm being I'm live, but I do the Google. Okay, so um, if I, I, ju I really would use that. And, and also there is, if you go on the website for this particular um, command, there are multiple um, pictures of those in charge. There are, there are numbers that you can reach out to for information. Um, and that's really important to call them if you don't think you're getting the information that you need to be a success when you get on the ground. So please reach out. That's really, and they would, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I would suspect 
as, as great officers and NCOs, they would be appalled if they knew that a soldier was coming here without good information. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Anna and I'm with the Spouse Sponsorship Program here at ACS. Uh -huh. We have a fantastic program and I cannot emphasize enough how important it is having mm -hmm. the spouses able to support their soldiers. We are looking for a lot of spouse sponsors right now mm -hmm. so that we have an active database mm -hmm. along with our FRGs and have them trained in sponsorship. Um, the, the only thing I can say is really happy wife, happy life and we support our soldiers Mm -hmm. And the information that's available to us not only <coughs> supports the soldiers in coming here, but it also increases cohesion in mm -hmm. the unit mm -hmm. and a lot of happiness. And I love Sergeant Google. He's my best friend. <laughs> and I use it all the time. Mm -hmm. And there's resources out there. There's Facebook, there's social media, there's Army One Source. I'm a complete nerd, but that's where I go. So... Mm -hmm. Feel free to, to hook up with ACS. They'll mm -hmm. get anyone in contact with the sponsorship program or myself. So I haven't seen your part of the website, but if you don't have something in there that says um, uh, spouse sponsorship, if you could maybe think about adding that, that would be another resource that somebody can have that they could jump right on and give somebody a call. Absolutely, okay. and we've got a lot of documentation for anyone that's coming here um, to support the relocation should the the soldiers um, not have enough information. Our sponsorship's more than happy to provide that. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Good information. Anybody else? Before we... Sir? Yes, ma'am. I'm Chaplain Mark Shelton, Family Life Chaplain, and I would just like to advocate for the Family Life Center. I don't know how much you could probably help with that, but if you could mention to somebody somewhere that we're in need of room and uh, we need here on the base well i think the family life center could use some growth and uh yes ma'am all over the military or here, here on the base <laughs> that too but here okay. on this base yes okay mm -hmm. i th i so think somebody's taking a note right now I, i'm <laughs> sure my boss has taken a note <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so well uh, thank you chaplain yes, and thank you for what you do for us yes, it's very important thank you listen i i really want to thank you i think there's probably no harder job than being a military spouse, male or female. I think it's a really tough job. You are left in contact every single day when your service member deploys um, or even goes out on training um, or even on a daily basis when they go to work. And oftentimes you are working too. Um, and you are the glue that holds that family together and makes the world go around. And, and if you have children, you, you normally are the glue that is the most is the person there with that child and your service member comes when they are at the end of the workday. So it is a hard job being a military spouse. It is a very hard job. And so I wanna um, thank you very much for that. Um, for those of you that are civilian employees, I also wanna thank you. I don't think that um, we uh, thank our civilians enough and I think it takes both the military side of the house, the family side of the house, and the civilian and the contractor side to make this whole thing that we call the Department of Defense work on a daily basis. So thank you very much for that. Um, General Williams, I'd like to ask you if you have any comments before we close. And I, I wanna publicly thank you and your staff for allowing me um, to come and visit. I truly appreciate it. Um, so thank you very much. And with that, I'll close. Thank you.